everybody the Pinat Cafe. Let's bring it together here. All right, so just a quick review. We covered an interesting topic, which was that we first described the quality of Yira Ilah over Yira Tata. We explained the higher fear is, is infinitely greater than the lower fear. That's how we started the conversation. In that, the higher fear reaches to a level of Bittul B'Metzias. You can go to, if you're, if you're before something infinite, and you realize that it's all-encompassing and there's nothing but it, it enables you to completely disappear out of reality and, and just become ultimately a nullity before Hashem. Whereas, if you're dealing with a contracted level of divinity, i.e. the divinity of Elul, where the king comes out of his palace, he comes out of his exaltedness, and he's dealing with you, so he's recognizing you and he's conforming himself, as it were, to your limitations, so there's no way to completely go out of your limitations, since he's the God making himself limited in order to allow your existence to be. You can't, from that, lose your existence. It's an impossibility. And therefore we realize we're stuck with a bitala yesh, the only thing we can do is sort of nullify our false attitudes. We can't really nullify ourselves entirely in Elul. Everyone with me on this? However, we turn the tables big time. Because we said that really you need Elul to come before Rosh Hashanah. Because you need to have this lower fear in order to achieve the higher fear. And not only because it's some kind of a preparation stage... But actually, because what are we trying to reach, uh, achieve with this higher fear? We're trying to bring down the ultimate bittle of Rosh Hashanah in order to have our sins forgiven, basically. It's ten, it's ten days of tshuva, which culminate in a complete atonement. And this is only achievable by truly in, in, incorporating the infinite light. And we said, you actually, seemingly, you could, you could grab onto that infinite light from just Rosh Hashanah, because Rosh Hashanah, as we said, is Yira Ilah. But somehow, no, you can't get there without Elul. And so we said that Elul actually contains an even higher level of Bittu. Strange as it sounds, based on what we said a moment ago, Elul actually has a higher level of Bittu. Who could tell me why? There's two reasons. I'll tell you what the two reasons are. One is that it's a Chiddush, and the other one is that it's qualitatively even better. So explain those two things. Start with the Chiddush. <laughs> What's the Chiddush? The talking bird. Are oh. real? Getting it right in there. The Chiddush is the talking bird, meaning what? That even though a bird's speech is not such, it's not a Harvard grad, but the truth is, is that because it's coming from a bird, it's even more fantastic than the speech from a human being. So too, the work of an individual who's far away from Hashem, trying to come close to Hashem. Is more of a chiddush, it's more delightful for Hashem than beings in the higher worlds who are automatically nullified to Him and do everything He says. Of course they're going to do what He says. Hashem is revealed there. There's no chiddush in the matter. So the idea of, of in general, the work of human beings in physical animalistic bodies in this world praising Hashem is much more precious to Hashem than the praise of the angels. Even their praise is technically much, much more sophisticated and advanced. It's not as precious because there's no chiddush in it. There's no novelty in it. No, no one's changing their nature. On the contrary, it is their nature. Second, that's so, th- so therefore the bitul ayesh of Elul is fantastic. In other words, okay, we're stuck with our, ourselves, but there's a quality in that which no one else in the universe can offer Hashem. So we're happy about it. But that's the small stuff. We said there's something even much, much greater. That the bitul of Elul is not just greater because it's a chiddish, it's actually greater. Why is it actually greater? It's actually more bitul. And why is that? That's your your cue, right? Yeah, well, you know. You're up. We're up for you now. It's, uh, it's hard work. Versus um, Rosh Hashanah, there is no work. There. So, like you said, the person is going against their nature. But you just said that. So. Well, right. So the idea is that it's actually more bittul, which means you're actually. What is bittul? Bittul is putting yourself on the side. The whole idea of being. Before we describe two levels of bitul, bitul ayesh, bitul matzias, right? Which means sort of, you know, curbing your appetites versus being a state of non-being. So seemingly being in the state of non-being 
is more putting yourself on the side than curbing your appetites. You would think. Yeah? But it's not like that. Why? Because to be in a state of non-being, which is achieved only by these like higher entities who experience the light of Hashem, the reason why the higher worlds are in a state of bitul mitzias, or the reason why, for example, we're easier able to gain an, an access to bitul mitzias on Rosh Hashanah is because there's revelations. The revelation of the day, it's Rosh Hashanah. It's the day of awe. The king is sitting on the throne judging you. There's a certain... And, and if you take this to the like analog above, it's the entities that are literally in front of Hashem. Of course they're bit of Matthias, but it doesn't actually get rid of their sense of self, strangely. Because the reason that they're bit of Matthias is because they feel the light. Because, be, because they have an experience of God, that's what makes them nullified to Him. So really, it's not, they're not going out of themselves. They're not putting themselves on the side. It's enjoyable for them. It's natural for them. They feel the revelation. That's, there's a cause that's making them put themselves on the side. And it's not, as you said, hard work. It's, it's because they feel the revelation. So he who is far from Hashem and feels no revelation, putting himself on the side, which is the definition of bitul, is happening much, much more than he who is experiencing the revelation. He doesn't have to put himself out and put himself on the side as much. Right? And when it comes to the quality of bitul, it means nullifying yourself. Someone who's not experiencing the light and yet obeys is an intense level of putting yourself on the side, much more than someone who does experience the light. And it helped Menachem in the last class to, with this mushal of Purim. Right? Just to bring it down, make it clear that why is it that we said this last time, but just again, I think it's for clarity purposes. Why is it that the Jewish people didn't really receive the Torah at the time of Matan Torah? And it said that it was all hanging until Purim. Only at the time of Purim did we truly receive the Torah, as it's known. Because during the time of Matan Torah, the revelations were so great. Of course we were going to see, receive the Torah. We weren't putting ourselves out all that much to accept this divine document when Hashem is showing us signs and wonders. So our, our nullity before Hashem, even though in a certain sense it was total, our souls, souls flew out of our bodies and we were... We were having a divine experience. We would have done anything, nice of a nishma, but it was based on the fact that it felt good to be nice of a nishma. Right? We saw God. Whereas in Purim, we, we could have been killed for being Jews, and yet we were Jews anyway. That's called the true acceptance of the Torah. That's called truly putting yourself out. When there's nothing in it for you, and yet you accept. So the bit, the quality of the bitl is even greater. Not just the novelty of the bitl. You follow? Hey, prophet. So here, just one, one at a time so, here. So, uh, because it's not like an active bittle, it's not as great. Like it's not like, it's not, uh, it doesn't require much like work. It's just sort of like given in considering the circumstances. So yeah, it's, you're not forcing yourself to do anything. And on the contrary, if you're not forcing yourself to do anything, you're not really putting yourself on the side. Yourself is very much highlighted. You're loving this. Right? So that's not called bitul. That's called bolstering self. Even though in the, mean, in, the, in the process of that, you're sort of like nullified out of existence from the rays of divinity. But it's happening to you, not from you. And so therefore the you which is in there, it's just like sort of temporarily negated. But, that, but if you would like sort of push away the light, the person who is there is very much strong in his own Matthias. He's, he's, he, you haven't taken him out. You just sort of drowned him out. Whereas the person who's bitul yesh, he's taken himself out. He's removed himself. And he's, yeah, yeah? You had a question? Uh, that's also clarifying. Bitul uh, and, uh, and the lower one is... No, that is the lower one. Oh. Well, I mean, <laughs> it depends actually how you... We're kind of on both... Uh, Frontiers here. Bitul Ayesh normally is the lower one. Bitul Matzias is the higher one. Bitul Matzias. But we flipped it around so that it's, the Bitul Ayesh is actually a stronger Bitul. Wait, Rabbi, so would a prophet be on the level of Bitul? Prophet is definitely Bitul. <coughs> What's that? Could just touch on the of the Could be, yeah. Yeah. Could see that, definitely. Okay. So, yeah. what, what is that? What is that difference between the higher and the lower bitul? Like, removing yourself and moving. How do you achieve the higher one? 
So except which one is the higher one at this juncture, right? In other words, each one has something the other one doesn't have. The bit of a metzias means you're no longer even aware of yourself at all. No longer aware of right? yourself at all. There is no more self. But the bit of a yesh is that there very much is a self, but he's conforming himself to do the right thing. Are you with me on that? So he feels himself, but he's, he's, he's making himself go against his nature every second in order to comply. Yeah, so the, right? second, the easier one, one would be being, uh, the second one, the first one. If the easier one is the first one, to a certain degree, right? Yeah. Because you've already mastered moving yourself aside. In right, so I guess put it like this, right? If you, how do you get to the bit of the Matthias? Right? It's because you are a more advanced individual. In other words, you're, you're able to experience revelation. Right? So a prophet, let's say, can experience complete nullity of self, but it's because he's a prophet. It's because he has a certain keen ability to experience God, which none, nobody else does. So on one hand... He had to work for that. Okay. Maybe he did. So if you don't want to use that analogy, then just say like the entities in the higher worlds who didn't have to work for it. All right? And by the way, a prophet, in a certain sense, he certainly had to work for it, but also people are born tzaddikim, right? So they don't have to work for it in the same sense. But let's just say the difference between angels or higher beings, it, the, their, their bitul of the Matthias is higher, but why are they able to get to that state of bitul? It's because their own recognition and feeling is what's giving them that experience, right? So they're not really working hard for that. The level they reach is actually a higher level. They go out of their whole entity, but, but, the, but the work that they're putting in is the main thing. Is it's, it's not only is it not work, it's enjoyable for them because they experience the light. So therefore, on, on, on one level it's higher, on one level it's lower. The, 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 the effort is really what makes bitul bitul, right? To take your, that's why the, the, the main thing we're, we're trying to say is putting yourself on the side. Who has to put themselves on the side more? The higher entities or the lower entities? The lower ones, right? And so, so in that sense, they have a higher st- level of self-nullity. In that sense. In another sense, the higher entities have a higher sense of self-nullity. Because they're actually be in front of the orange sof and they experience only the orange sof. They don't even experience themselves at all. So say each one has a certain quality the other, other one doesn't have. So when you say which one's higher, which one's lower, at this point you've confused ourselves. You, I can't answer you that straight. You have to, we have to decide on which quality we're discussing. Right? But in the sense that putting yourself on the side and forcing yourself to do something and getting out of your own way, that's a greater bit in the level of bitul ayesh. The, uh, the effort this is yours or mine? Uh, okay. <laughs> yeah. The effort that a person has to put forth to achieve this is higher than anything I can think of. Like if I wanted to be a master of this or that, yeah, so I would dedicate my life to, to achieving that. But it's only during that time. With serving God, it's like uh, it's it's all the time. Yeah. So, you know, but the truth is, is to, yeah, to it, yeah, it's true what you're saying. I mean, you could use anything as an example that if you want to be in good shape, it's also really all the time. I mean, no, it's when you're eating, when you're, you know, you have to. Even when we sleep, though. I mean, you know, I have to sleep like this, you know. Okay. Small, like, we're always serving God, always, like, working on ourselves. Even when you sleep, also, it, it, it refers to a lot of things. I'm saying, you're right. Serving God is completely inclusive, but you can, you can at least learn from other things. You know, if you stay up late... And you, and, and you don't get a good night's sleep, you're also weakening yourself. In other words, there's a certain sense of just wholeness, which in, if you want to do, really be good at anything, you have to put your whole self into it, you know? And, but you're right, the, the ultimate thing is that all of those are aspects of divine service. Anyway, I think we got the point. Let's go on to Os Zion. Al Pizeh, accordingly, Yesh Levoer Masha Kasuba Maimer, we want to now explain what it says in the Mayim, Rasham Shachas Makif to Rosh Hashanah, that drawing down this Makif of Rosh Hashanah, if you recall, this infinite light that we're trying to become forgiven with, it fills in all the blemishes. He be'ikr aydi ayira v'acharada haba aydi tekiyah shofar de'elu. Right? It primarily comes from the fear and dread that comes from blowing the shofar in Elu. 
I think we did this actually. We'll just do it again real quick. Because this, that, um, that comes through the fear of who uh, hamshachas amaki vayis, right? Because why? This that through fear, i.e. bitul, you're able to draw down the hamshacha of the bayis. Who remembers the bayis, right? We said the house. We said that the idea of Torah mitzvahs is like heaven and earth, right? And Torah mitzvahs is just Hashem's footstool and His throne, right? And so if all of heavens and earth is just a little chair, basically, then obviously how can you hold Hashem? In other words, if heaven, heavens and earth, and which is Torah mitzvahs, with, if, even if you're going to arrive at Torah mitzvahs, all you're getting to is a, a little chair. A little chair doesn't hold Hashem. Where's the house that's going to hold Hashem? The house is so big. The house is like the ultimate, you know, what box that holds God, right? If heavens and earth, he can't fit into that box. He's much bigger than the box of heavens and earth. How are you going to get him in here, right? So what holds him? And even Torah mitzvahs, which you would like to hold him, they're compared to, you know, heavens and earth. They're compared to his, his throne and his, and his footstool. They, they, you, if you, even if you grab them, and somehow you're not going to be able to grasp Hashem. So we said the only thing that really holds him is to be broken of spirit, totally humble. To, be, to reach a state of brokenness, humbleness. In other words, putting yourself on the side. That, going back to that definition of bitul. Because if you put yourself on the side... Then there's room for someone else. There's room for him. Then you can hold him. <clears throat> so he says, "This is therefore be'ikur kesha chadradi hiba ofen the bit of a shiflus." Right? The, when can you grab the house energy, this divine energy which is holds Hashem, which is the infinite light? It's through lowliness. But kamavur ba ma'amar de kol sha adam mashpilas atzmo yoser, and we explain to the ma'amar that the more a person will lower himself. The level of makif, the level of infin- infinite light, he goes and achieves higher and higher ones. So there's different levels of bitul. The more you'll nullify yourself, the more infinity you can let in. As we spoke about already several times, there's different levels of makif, right? There's the clothing and there's the house. Both of them are sort of surrounding light that don't get internalized, but at different levels. Because we said the surrounding light of the clothing, it's already leaning towards having some connection to the person because it's tailor-made to the body, right? So there's different levels of makif. You can access different levels depending on how much you lower and humble yourself. The more nothing you are, the more greater levels of infinity that can arise inside of you. <coughs> Which one did we call sovev? Both of those are called sovev. Did you say they're makif? Makif and sovev are very, pretty much the same thing. V'lechein ikar amshachas makif. Therefore, the main drawing forth of this Maki flight, who are the Ayir of the Elo? It really, you reach the highest level of infinity through the fear and, uh, and, and, and dread that comes with the Elo Bittu. Ki Ayir of the Rosh Hashanah, because why? The fear and Bittu that you, are, you achieve on Rosh Hashanah, why does it come to you? It's because Al Yidesha Margish Hagilo Dilamaila. It's because you feel something, it's a holy day. And therefore, there's something that's accomplished for you from above. And therefore, what you're experiencing is not putting yourself on the side. You're experiencing yourself, basically, having this lovely experience of God. So you don't actually get to remove yourself, put yourself on the side. It's true there's a tremendous bitl that comes about because of the holiness of the day. Because it's not being accomplished by you, and you're not, therefore, forcing yourself to do something, you're not putting yourself out. You're not putting yourself on the side, as we just described. This is the... Even though it's a higher bitul, it's a higher revelation, it's really a lower level of self-sacrifice. And therefore, it's specifically the Elul experience. When there's no great light, when Hashem dresses down, and He's a, a king in the field, and He's not showing you His exaltedness, they, and leaving you in your state of distance to a certain degree, that you are able to work and truly put yourself on the side. And therefore, that is what draws down the highest level of makif. Right? Yeah, the work itself is the, is the self nullity, the putting yourself on the side. That you don't want to, but you'll do it anyway, right? If you want to, so, so you're not putting yourself on the side, right? If there's a tremendous divine light and revelation, your own Matthias is going to be drawn to that. You don't have to sacrifice anything, right? If there's no revelation, then it's all about sacrifice. That's bitul. You understand? Like and therefore, the with Purim, the, the, like the story of Purim, the Purim story is exactly the point. 
It was a, it was a greater reception of Torah, i.e. it was a greater reception of divine essence when we didn't see revelations. There is revelation in Elul. Just not as much as I mean, there's revelation in Elul. I think there's a certain type of revelation in that, you know, we're in being empowered, right? The whole idea of the king in, is in the field, is he's coming to the field to empower us. So that's a type of revelation. But the whole concept, the, the, the famous question that's asked in the original Mimer, which is, if the 13 attributes of mercy are shining, why isn't it a holiday, right? Like a Yom Tov. Like a Yom Tov, right? So that's coming to tell you that there is no revelation. In other words, there, 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 that the revelation that's coming is this very faint empowerment, which is really just an encouragement. It's not giving you light. It's telling you, get up and, and, and go see the king, right? Which the whole thing is, is that it's coming from you. It's motivation, right? But, but it, yeah. But the idea is that if it would give you really like a, a push out the door, it would not be doing its job, right? Because it, So therefore, when you say there's revelation in Elul, it's a funny one because the whole concept of the revelation is that the revelation hides so that you're really not aware of it. It, but the Alter Rebbe is like, Al Pinimi is a Torah, you know, he's bringing out. Hasid is telling you that it's there, but he's, at the same time he's telling you that it's there, he's telling you it's not the kind of thing that you're going to experience a Yom Tov. You're going to experience a weekday. You're going to ex- right? And, but, but know that in a weekday there's something very special, dafka more than in a Yom Tov. Right? So in other words, it's giving you a type of very, very Hasidic type of revelation that in the darkest things contains the highest things. It's, you still st- see dark. But if you use your head, you realize that in the darkest things, there's the highest thing. Right. So how, how, what is this makif, like when it's drawn down, like what, does that, what does that look like? What does that do? What it's kind of it makes God be inside of you. Let's look at the, uh, back at the original mimer again. We said that Ani Ladodi Vadodi Li is my beloved is to me. And we said that was the, your treasure house of, treasure house of Yiro Shamayim that's going to be available for you the whole year long. And based, you know, the idea is that any time you're going to serve God, you're going to be, it's really Him that's serving, right? It's, 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 it's Him that, he, he wants a dwelling place in the lowest worlds. So you have to make a kli, so that He can dwell there. But it's Him that's dwelling in there. Mm. So your whole p- full potential of godliness to be in your life for the entire year is, comes on Rosh Hashanah. Because you're bringing down the potential, and that's what it means, this bitul ilah, like that you achieve. That's, you know, you're, you're actually getting like a dose for your whole year of all your potential divine service, essentially. So you said that God is, he's more in the darkest place than the like, highest place, right? So are you saying that he's more in this world than, uh, example, uh, Bihya or... For sure, for sure he is. Yeah? Yeah. I mean, that's in, a, in the sense that he's more hidden. More hidden, yeah. But in the hiddenness, there's an ability to achieve a higher level of him. And he's more approachable these days. But in, in, you're right. He's saying now, just in general, between higher worlds and lower worlds, where is the God found more? Right. Yeah. So, so, so it, here's the whole point. It's the same conversation we were having before. It, it completely depends. You cannot answer that question with one statement. It's like it, it requires a whole circular reasoning. In in a normal sense, you would say that Hashem is certainly found in the higher worlds more than the lower worlds. That's why they're called the higher worlds. But but if you sort of cut it up for a second and, and realize what's really going on here. It's really the exact opposite. That yes, Hashem minimizes His revelations all as He's coming down the world until He gets to this lower world where there's no revelation and therefore it's proper to say that they're higher than this one. But we're in that place where there's no revelation, suddenly you have access to something that all the higher worlds don't have, which is free choice. And when you exercise your free choice, you exercise the essence of Hashem. That's why the Torah is not found up there, or the mitzvah, if you could really properly say, is not found up there. And, and therefore, what? You can't do Hashem's will in those higher worlds. What's greater, being like some kind of an expression of Hashem's will or making His will? And in this world, you have a mitzvah, it's called the Ratzon Hashem. You can do Hashem's will. You're, you're the agent. That's called, that's what you were just asking. What is this mitzvah mitzvah? It's that God's will is coming through you. You know, you're, you're forming it. Right? You're not just like sort of a, a, 
a extension of it, which which is coming off automatically, which is the revelations of the higher worlds and the angels and so forth, you are actually creating the will of Hashem. Your determination is His determination. So you're, ac- you're accessing the access of will of God. They do not ever have their hands on the will of God. They're a product mm-hmm. of the will of God. Right? Mm-hmm. So this is again the same exact model, which is, you'll find it basically in every single Hasidic Maimah that there is, because this is the whole Chiddush of Hasidus, to tell you that in the darkest places, you'll find the highest light. And it's not just a joke. And therefore, this, from this, you can, your whole life will improve. Because if you realize, you know, if you realize that in the negative things, God is there more, you'll never be unhappy. You'll be, you'll be like a perfect servant of God. Mm-hmm. Most people know that statement. You know, you go on the street, it's like pop psychology. It's just pop, you know, self-help. Like, don't worry, it's all good. <laughs> but to know that in a very deep way, to like not understand the mechanics of it, that it's not a belief it's a knowledge, a factual knowledge that gets into you in the whole other way and it enables you to actually know that it's good. And therefore, you're transformed. You know, you've undone the darkness. It's not dark anymore. When I, when I like think of that statement, right, I, I also uh, keep in mind like, you know, like, like um, how do I say this? Um, like you're dirtying yourself by not fulfilling the will of Hashem. You know, like in the darkest times, you you are, you are, you are, um, there's dust on it. You know, like you're dusting yourself. So okay. So how, so how could, like, knowing that, and knowing that everything will be good at the same time, that's kind of contradictory, because you are dusting yourself at the same time. Like you are going, like you are seeking deeper into this darkness. But at the same time, this is all for the best, so. Mm. So that's what something you know bothers my mind when I want to think like oh well yeah I'm just going you know I'm just sinking lower into this whatever state phase in order to come back out but at the same time, I guess it's, that's the point it's not just in order to come back up and get out of it it's the realization that it is is also God and not only is it God but it's such a level of God that it's beyond comprehension that's why it, to you it looks bad. So it's, there's two levels of it. says that there's Yisra or Mina Choshech, right? There's the state. What we're dealing with is a is a classic conversation of there's an advantage of light from darkness, and the simple reading is well. There's three there's three there's three ways of reading this. One is simple. Light is better than dark. Okay, obviously. One is there's an advantage of light that comes from dark. That when you arrive at a certain level of light, right? Because you went through darkness that light that you achieved, having gone through the bad times, is even more precious. Right. right? But that's only level two. There's a higher level. Which is an advantage of light that comes from the darkness itself. Not as a result of having gone through the darkness and leaving the darkness in its place. But if you can turn darkness itself into light, then that's the greatest advantage of light. No light has a greater property than that. Why? Because most light is concealable. That it's light until it gets dark, right? And therefore the light is limited. But if you can figure and understand which this truth, which we're sort of bringing out on different levels, that darkness is not a real thing. Darkness is an unbelievably strong light. It's like looking into the sun. It's so bright, you're blind. And that is what darkness is. If you can realize that the darkness itself is nothing but light, then you've re- then that's the true advantage of light over darkness. Why? Because now there's nothing that can conceal light anymore. You've turned your enemy into your friend. You don't have any enemies. It's not like you're temporarily winning this battle until your enemy will rise up again. Even if you've gained a lot of strength from having beaten your enemy. So you'll say there's an advantage of light from darkness. If I haven't gone through that horrible point in my life, I wouldn't be the man I am today. That's only stage two. There's a deeper level. That in the state of darkness, you have the wherewithal to realize that this is God. And not only is it God, it's the greatest level of divine, of divinity that there is. And in that moment, you can push it, turn the, the sad thing itself into light. And that's what we're saying right now about the bit of Ayesh. It's the same conversation. Is that like in a this, snap to It's not a, I don't know if it's a snap, it's a deep realization. That's what I'm saying. It's not just a, 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 a hallmark postcard, you know. It's something about coming to the realization of what is before you, that all there is is God. 
So it, it's impossible that the situation that's presented before me is something bad because God is good. So why am I seeing bad? Because it's such a level of divinity. It's co- coming from such a place. And you have to really meditate on that. You have to get deeply into it. You have to sort of be there. I don't know. It's not so pushy. We don't, we don't really wish that on our best friends. But, but um, to, have, to have the experience, you know, we, we shouldn't go through the experience. But sadly, we're already all in the experience because we're in Gullis. You know, so we have to... The whole, why was the Rebbe so cheerful and so, so optimistic? Because he, all he saw Gullus was, was you, know, you know, the famous word, Gola, which means exile, is the same words as Geula. All you have to do is put the Aleph in. What's the Aleph? Geula is re- uh, redemption. What's the Aleph? Seeing this thing, seeing that everything is Hashem. See, Al- Aleph is Alufo Shel Olam, the master of the world. In the Gullus itself, it's Geula. All you have to do is see the, the Aleph. Is that Shiva? That's tshuva on the highest level. So anyway, back to our point. This is the same thing as bittul ayesh. You know, you're stuck with your own existence. You're far from Hashem, but in that very place resides the greatest opportunity to receive the ultimate level of bittul. And if you would be, so to speak, better off and have more revelation of Hashem, you would be much further away from being able to experience the true God, the true level of bittul, because it's not even available for you. You don't have free will. Okay, so going on, therefore the main hamshach of the bittel is in Elul. Because the bittel that comes from Rosh Hashanah is a sort of feeling of self involved in it, the bittel shall the hergish agilui ain't about over the shiflus. On Rosh Hashanah, the feeling, the, the bittel that comes from a feeling, a revelation, it's not a bittel that comes from lowliness. It's actually a bittel that comes from your own highness. You get it. You experience. You have the wherewithal. You're not down and out. The ikra in the anivanaki ruach, the main Indian of impoverished and broken of spirit, is a bitl in a way of shiflus, really feeling lowly, like it's Purim, and there's no God in sight, right? That gives you a feeling of lowliness. Who by Yirbacharar the Elul. And this is connected with the Indian of Elul. It's interesting, Elul and Adar, sort of both the month right before the great revelation, they both have this experience of uh, God sort of disappears for a second. Okay, let's now finally go on for today's class. Yesh Yosef od bir ba'amayla shabayir de elo al ayir de Rosh Hashanah. There's yet another. There's yet another. Um, Maila, another advantage in Elul's fear over that of Rosh Hashanah. The cave and Shayir of Abito de Elul. Ba Ali de Avodasim shall Yisrael ani ledodi. Since the fear and bitl of Elul comes, as we've been saying, specifically through our service. In other words, it's the Yid that is more in the spotlight as opposed to Hashem who is in the spotlight, right? Where's the bitl coming from in Rosh Hashanah? From above to below. He's the active ingredient which creates the bitul. Whereas in Elul, the Yid is the active ing- ingredient that creates the bitul. So that it's all about our service. Ani Lododi. Da Shoresh the Yisrael Huba Atzmus. This is this is getting pretty deep now. Here it comes. Right? Why is it that the, you know, of all the things we said, how this bitul is greater, this is the real reason for it. It's because the root of a yid comes from the very essence of God. Therefore, what's drawn out from our fear, from our bitl, from our work, from the yid being a yid, is hamshachas atzmus. What we really bring out, therefore, and what we have our hands on, the trigger on, is the essence itself. It's very similar to what we were saying when you asked me which world is higher, Bria or this world, right? And we'll say, on a certain sense, there's so much revelation. You know, in Bria, God is there, obviously Bria, but no. Because there, you don't have the ability to do Hashem's will. And what is Hashem's will? It's Him. Right? So, you have a sort of, specifically by removing all the light, getting rid of the revelations, because the revelations are not Him. What is revelation? What is light by definition? It's a shine, a ray of something that comes out to try to capture the source of the light, but never really captures it. Mm. Right? That's what the Orein Sof is. You have something called Ein Sof, which is just God. 
And you have the light of the Ein Sof, mm. which is forever, it's a forever light, it goes on forever. Why? Because it's infinitely trying to describe and bring to, to, bring to light what the Ein Sof is, and since it's impossible, it goes on forever. The descriptions go on forever and ever and ever because they're trying to describe something that ultimately, even if you would speak forever, literally, you could never describe it. What does it show you? That the essence is beyond the revelations. It's something that the revelations can never truly capture. And here we're saying that you're going to have this great bitto called the house. We're going for it. We're going to hold us. What is the house? It's the, it's the orain sof. It's just the light. <clears throat> and a yid, which is, this is just, he just says this. This is a fact, but he doesn't explain in deeper way. But this is just what's going on. A yid is coming from Hashem's essence. A Jew is beyond the light. In other words, in the same way that it's impossible to describe Hashem, and it would take or ein sof in order to try and do so, and you still wouldn't succeed. The same is true with you. You're an essential being, and your essence is one with God's essence in infinite lifetimes, and with infinite descriptions, and infinite beings, and creatures, and light, and angels. You'll never describe what a yid is. He's the essence of Hashem. And so therefore, when the yid is highlighted, like we're saying in Elul, the Indian is us, not the Orang Sof. The king in the field, remember, is not God in, in the analogy. It's the 13 attributes of mercy. It's light. So who's really higher? The king or the guy who's going out to see him? The guy who's going out to see him. Right? Because he represents, he's the Jew. And he's just going to greet the light, as it were. So since the avoda is being done by the Jew, Ani Ladodi, and the source of a Jew is in the essence, therefore the Amshacha, what you draw out, is essence. What you're bringing to the table is essence, not light. In other words, what you're uncovering from yourself when you have to do the work, whenever you do like the smallest step towards Hashem, who's acting there, what level of divinity is operated on, let's put it like that. You know, you have, you have different divine flows, right? We know this, you have... You have Hashem as he dresses up himself up in ten spheros. It's a limited version of Hashem. You have Hashem as he is beyond the worlds. You know, but, but in the same sense, he has the worlds in mind. It's the Indian of Kesser. Like we said, like the clothing. Sovev. But it's still Sovev Kol Almin. It's still around the world. Then you have complete infinite light, which doesn't even take the worlds into account. These are all different levels of divinity. And then you have him. The ultimate level of divinity Beyond all revelation, the essence of Hashem. When do you get to see that? You know, if I do this mitzvah, I'll pull down from this trigger. If I do this, I'll do... in Elul, when it's all about the focus is just the yids of Oda, you actually have access suddenly to the essence of Hashem. The Yesh Lomar, and that means to say, Shezewatama Panimi, this is really the, the, the big punchline of the whole thing. She said, this is the inner reason, this is why from the lower fear of Elul, that's why suddenly that translates on Rosh Hashanah to having the higher fear. Why? Because by, by, by what you're doing in Elul, you're, you're tapping into the very essence of God. And therefore, all through this, you draw out the revelations. Oh, yeah. So your Rosh Hashanah, where you're going to have this exalted king with the orange so shining to you, you know what that is? It's just your own light reflecting back at you. In other words, because you've sort of summoned the essence, well, when you summon the essence, the essence comes with revelations. Right? So the revelations of Rosh Hashanah is the orange so that's coming out of you. Not the orange so that's coming from above to below. Why is it that all of a sudden, after Elul Avoda, you get this unbelievable bias this unbelievable house, this infinite light, which suddenly gets drawn out. What made it get drawn out? It's because when the essence is summoned, the essence automatically reveals itself. So when you reveal the, when you bring forth the essence in Elul, it reveals itself on Rosh Hashanah. And this is, this is the Orain Sof that's a product of your own avoda, your own avoda tapping into the essence. See, if you follow this? Okay. Um, <clears throat> yeah. Is that what happened in the temple? Right, I mean, P. People, yeah. People went into the temple. Rabbi, okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, because he is a Rabbi K in Australia. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, buddy. Um, yeah, so people would go into the Holy Temple, and then they would see what God saw in people, right? What did you say? You would see what? They, they would see what God saw in the person. 
So isn't it like they the would say what God. I didn't hear you. So in the holy temple, they, when just the say it again. They would see what God saw in them. Oh, saw in them. Okay. So it's kind of like a reflection of what God sees in us. Isn't, isn't that like what it is? Yeah. Make me. Yeah, it's an interesting. But the idea is that, again, you know, we like to think about God is up there and the world is down here. But it's not really like that. God is everywhere. And there's just different aspects of Him. Right? And there's some aspects where He's shiny. There's some aspects where He's dark. You know, there's, it's all Him. It's, it's either Klippa or Kedusha. And in Kedusha itself, it's either higher, limited Kedusha or infinite Kedusha. And there's essence. You know? So all those things are played out in this playing field right here on the earth. And the essence of Hashem is found inside of you. You know, this is not a simple thing. I, I, you have no idea. Right? In other words, where is I, all these different levels of divinity? Are, you, you can go and visit them. Right? And you want to visit the essence of Hashem. You see a Yid at work. A Yid putting himself on the side. Because why? Why is that the Yid at work? Because, let me, let me bring it another way. Free choice. Okay, which is what we're after over here, right? Again, when the revelations are coming to you and your bittel, that's not com coming from your free choice. That's why it's not such a big bittel. Free choice is when you decide, un uh, uh, unbribed, as it were, from any angle. You're just deciding on your own. This is why the essence of Hashem, this is a proof, so to speak, that the essence of Hashem is found inside of you. Because the only place that free choice in fact exists is by Hashem. Who has free choice? Who could decide something? Right? Only God can decide something. Everything else is a, is a product of His decisions. He's the only first cause. If He's the cause of all things, then everything else is caused by Him and it doesn't get to decide where it wants to go and what it gets to do. The only place that free choice exists in the entire cosmos, which having learned a little bit of Hasidus, you understand what I mean when I say that. It's beyond comprehension how much stuff there is. The only place in that whole circus of what's going on that there's such a thing called free choice is in two places. God Almighty and you. And, and the reason for that is because God Almighty put Himself in you. When you're deciding, so to speak, a free choice, it's His free choice that you're making. Because He's you at that level, at the Yid level. And so, yes, you're right. The reflection of that is that when, when you access Hashem, so then, of course... What shines out of that is infinite orient self light, divinity on all kinds of levels, trying to express and bring to light what is that little simple free choice of a yid. It winds up being your Rosh Hashanah, which is a whole dose of energy and godly life for an entire year that's going to sustain you. It's your own free choice that makes that, your own essential God inside of you. Clear? And do, okay. we, also, do we also gain the Kli in order to house that light throughout the year? That's uh, Torah and mitzvahs. In other words, it doesn't. Once you have it, you still have to, so to speak, bring it down. Right. And 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 make room for it. The problem is, is implying that on Rosh Hashanah you don't have a choice whether to go to Shul or not. It's just Rosh Hashanah. But that's not so true. On, on Rosh Hashanah you can still sin. Right. No, you're 100 percent right. We're not saying that. Remember we said in the beginning of this first Mimer that Lamed base of Lukute Torah, which, which is, has the Mimer Ani Ladodi Vadodi Li on it, it's like Lamed base of the Tanya. It's the heart of the whole Hasidus. It doesn't mean that Elul, Elul's all the time. Elul's even on Rosh Hashanah. Right? In other words, there's always the free choice of a year. There's always this place where you're, listen, I mean, Alavai, we were like sitting in the Orange Sof. Even on Rosh Hashanah, we're Mamish far, far, far away from Hashem. What's, what's he really saying? What's he really saying is that Honestly, when are you more likely going to go to shul? On a regular Thursday after a Fabrengen or Rosh Hashanah? <laughs> In other words, you're not saying you don't have free choice anymore. But, but the, the, the sort of focus is, is, is it's the, the ability to tap into this free choice is much more available. It's like, it's, 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 it's um, you know, it's fertile ground to do this avoda more in El than it is in Rosh Hashanah. Because there is a certain, not, it's not such a level of revelation like the angels in, 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 in Bria, but it is a certain revelation that you're not going to sleep in on Rosh Hashanah. There's like forces at play, you know, that are going to make you have a sort of, you know, extra, extra, extra something, extra sauce.
So, it, and, and the, in real reality, the truth is, is there is a godly revelation that's happening inside of your soul that makes you feel that way. That's why even a Yid who doesn't even go to shul ever during a year, he's going to drive to shul on Rosh Hashanah. He makes sure he's the first one there. He gets his good private parking place. In other words, what is it in, in, in Jews that makes them all suddenly, you know, wake up on Rosh Hashanah? There actually is a revelation in your soul, a revelation from above. But the truth is, is what that revelation it really is, and how great it is and so forth, how much use of your free will. It's a revelation of the essence. And every yid, as we said before, everyone's doing something in Elul to get prepare themselves for this on a conscious or unconscious level. They know the day of judgment is coming. Trust me, they all know. Level is, is right? what's, that, what's that? An unconscious level is not Bashir, right? I'm saying, but the unconscious level is that they know Rosh Hashanah is coming. And they're going to be a little bit better than they were the day before. Okay, but I'm saying, the, yeah, it winds up being, con- but not necessarily. I mean, conscious, conscious and unconscious, what I mean by that is just that, obviously when they're making the good decisions, it's conscious. But, you know, they're not like living in a Jewish world, so to speak, where they're really planning on Rosh Hashanah. It's just that they're aware of it. It's that they're sort of unconsciously aware that there's this reason to be a little bit better than usual. Yeah. I just want to touch on Abram's question on, uh, on how to make that clean for him to like, like for the rest of the year he's talking about after you bring down the lights so why you, you might think like okay now I have the revelation of the orange soap now even that it already you have to hold hold it with the vessels the Torah mitzvahs but that's already after Rosh Hashanah what about, what about during Elul like don't you have to like also be able to like in order to take in that all that light you have to have a vessel for it Right now, though, the, the voda is not to take in light. The voda is to bring forth the essence, right? And the essence is the proper usage of your free will. Bringing your free will and exercising it at every moment. Because that's where the essence of Hashem is found. There's not a lot of light in that experience. There's anything but light in that experience. Hmm. And then, and then Elul, the expression of free will is developing the lower level of expression. Yeah, I mean, it exp- it exp- yeah, being being on the game, on your game, you know, doing everything right, like not allowing yourself to fall into old patterns, doing a serious calculation on who you are and what you're doing and how you talk to people and your wife and your children and your students and your teachers, like get it together in a way where you're just not going to go sleepwalking through life like one can do. Yeah. Why is the epitome of the Shirah found in El and not during the year when you don't have the inspiration of Rosh Hashanah coming out? That's, that was your real question, in other words, from before. Is there is a certain level of inspiration in Elul. Right. I guess the idea is that Hashem loves us and He, and he wants us to... He knows Rosh Hashanah is coming also. And he knows there's like a sort of day on the calendar that's going to determine our entire year. So in his own little quiet, secret way, he makes it a little bit more available to us to access our free will without disturbing it with revelations. But you're right. There's obviously something special. In other words, in the month of, uh, in the month of Elul, in that you know, it urges us to exercise our free will. Um, and you could, you, could, you could definitely make the argument that, that after all the, the lights are over and all is said and done, it's even more so. In other words, like Mar Cheshvan, when Tishrei is over, there is such a vort. If you have inspiration of Cheshvan, right. I feel like that would be... Right. That, that, that's a big vort. We're going to speak about it, right? What, what's the whole idea of, of Cheshvan? It's basically the, the notion of, uh, you know, the, 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 the weekday after the Shabbos. You know? Right, because it's all about avoda. In the sense that there's n- there's no inspiration, so similar idea, but we're in Elo. I mean, in, in a certain sense, it's the same idea. It's just we're highlighting it. Okay. So in this understanding that Bittul is a higher level, that's because it's, it's like an appropriate expression of free will. It's like we have the free will to go one way or the other, but we're like yeah. Making the right choices. All right, let's go on a little bit. We have some more time here, five minutes. Okay. All right, so let's... The home stretch. Hine al derech zeh hugam be'inyan ha-tshuva de'elu. So he says, the truth is that in the same vein, this is the tshuva of elu. De'zeh shabah elu tokim b'shofar. This in elu, we blow the shofar. This is as we said a little bit earlier from the tour 
al pi alacha kedei lazhir Yisrael shiasu tshuva. Why do we blow the shofar in order to warn us, as it were, to do tshuva? Sheish b'ze yis yisaron al hatshuva de Rosh Hashanah, and we're saying that there is actually an advantage in this tshuva over the tshuva of Rosh Hashanah. That even though the truva of Elul is a truva from negative things, Kapshuto, in other words, it's not like sort of a truva of a tzaddik, it's literally truva. You have to undo bad deeds. It's a real truva from the sense of, that you're, you're turning away from negative behaviors. As it's known from what the Arizal said, that Elul is the Roshi Tevos of Inul Yadu Basamtilacha. Where it says, I will, it, it, it's, it's, an, it's a reference to the cities of refuge. That I brought it to his hand and I placed for you six cities of refuge. So that spells Elul. The first letter of each of those words spells Elul. The Ari Miklat, who tikkun al inyani built it to And what does this tell you? That Elul is someone who murdered, you know, and, and it's, a, it's a serious thing. Like you did something wrong. You have, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a place that you need to take refuge from your actual bad behavior. And this, he says parenthetically, that the truth of Elul is hinted to by the fact that it's, it's, it spells the Ari Miklat, which is that the Kapara of the Ari Miklat, he al maka nefesh bishkaga. So you say, wait a second. Yes, it's negative things, but it's about, it's about killing someone by accident. Right? Right? right. So what's that all about? Ki agdei atshuva de Rosh Chodesh Elul. This is like already the big chiddush that he brings over here. I mean, we're telling you too late, but he says the tshuva that you do on Rosh Chodesh Elul, the first day of Elul, with that tshuva of that one day, nasus donos kishkagos. All of your intentional sins are turned into made as though they're unintentional sins. Mm. Now I tell you, that tshuva de Elul. He letaken ashkagos, and therefore the rest of the month, your all, all you have left is unintentional sins, because all of your of your intentional sins, pashut ayids, thanks to uh, the wedding and everything, ayids uh, ayids tshuva in, on Rosh Chodesh Elul, knowing that his mama just hit Elul, whatever happens to him, his free will, let's say on a good day, he turns, he already has the power to turn the intentional things as though he did it. But you know, he does it such a strong tshuva that he already undoes. His wickedness that he went against Hashem, and it all is made as though he did everything by accident. Because at the end of the day, a Jew really only ever does sin by accident. We have a nefesh elokis, and the only reason he sins because this 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 animal drags him into a direction he doesn't ever really want to go in. So they're all accidental sins. So that becomes highlighted once you hit Elul. Everything is you can you, you, we'll take you as you really are. You're a yid who, who accidentally fell off the derech, and they were there for the rest of the whole tshuva process of Elul is just. Is all tshuva on accidental sins, and therefore the cities of refuge is 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 the uh, acronym for Elul because the whole Elul we're, we're sitting inside of a place where we need to do tshuva for our accidental sins. Uh-huh. <laughs> but he's saying here that so so okay so the true even though the tshuva that you're doing is for real sins kapshuto and the tshuva of Rosh Hashanah. Whereas the tshuva that you're doing on Rosh Hashanah, since it comes after Elul, it's a tshuva where you've already fixed all your negative things, even your accidental negative things. So it's a very high level of tshuva in that sense, because you're already like a tzaddik, right? Theoretically, you've gone through Elul, you've been, you've done tshuva for everything, even for your accidental sins. So there's still tshuva on Elul, but, excuse me, on Rosh Hashanah, but it's a much higher level of tshuva. So he says, "I get tshuva de Elul. He beiker tshuva ilo, right? So therefore, the Rosh Hashanah, having gone through the tshuva of Elul, your tshuva of Rosh Hashanah is mainly what we call tshuva ilo. Much like we said before, it's called yira ilo. Mikol makom, nevertheless, yesh yisaron. There's still an advantage in the tshuva of Elul over the tshuva of Rosh Hashanah. Same idea, and we're going to get into it tomorrow, obviously, but." It's the same idea that just like Yira Tata had an advantage over Yira Ila, we're going to see in a whole other framework why the Tshuva Tata, the lower Tshuva, Tshuva from real sin, even though it's lower, ultimately becomes higher than Tshuva Ila. We'll see tomorrow how it has an advantage over the Tshuva of a Tzaddik. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Shkoya. Shkoya. Shkoya.
crazy. Yeah. Wow. All right. Good job. Right. <laughs> you said before that basically explains because every Jew has their own stuff. Yeah.